You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. For the last five months, the Roman Catholic Church in the United States has faced a growing set of challenges. Most immediately, hundreds of incidents of sexual abuse of children and adolescents by priests and other church workers have been made public. Compounding that news has been the revelation that bishops and other church officials have systematically covered up those acts by shifting priests from parish to parish. This coming Thursday, the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops will assemble in Dallas, Texas for their spring meeting. Dominating the agenda are two draft proposals, one entitled, A Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People. The second is entitled, Essential Norms for Diocesan Policies Dealing with Allegations of Sexual Abuse by Minors by Clergy and Other Church Personnel. To discuss the issues, opportunities, and potential pitfalls facing the bishops, and by extension the Roman Catholic Church in the United States, I am joined this morning by Bill Magis, a professor of theology and the chair of the Department of Theology at Xavier University. Bill, welcome to Newsmakers. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having um, me. What do you see as the real challenge, the real goal that the bishops have to accomplish this coming week? I'd say the goals are several. First, they need to restore some level of trust and confidence in their leadership ability, especially their moral leadership. Um, they need to make it very clear that they are concerned about the victims and survivors of abuse and not simply rightful protection of people, clergy who might be accused wrongfully. But uh, the emphasis, I think, in the past has been a little bit too much in the perception, I think, of most people on um, protecting the institution, being defensive, rather than being more forthcoming in terms of addressing the, the very real needs of those who have been victims and survivors of abuse. What will it take these, those few days to really make movement in that, those directions uh, concretely? What will it take to, to convince people that something real is happening along those lines? I think it'll take a number of things. First, I think there'll have to be a, a fairly high level of unanimity among the bishops in support of this draft charter. Mm. So that namely, if it becomes public that the divi there's division among the bishops about this issue, um, that won't help them in terms of restoring kind of a, a sense of trust and And, uh, and I think the indication is we do know that going into these meetings, there are divisions about certain issues in these, in, in these drafts, right? Exactly. And so that's the first issue is to try to overcome those divisions and see if they can go forward, at least in terms of broad policy. Part of the reason that there might be some of the division is that historically bishops are very um, careful about stepping on the territory or the rights of individual bishops. Each bishop, by virtue of consecration as a bishop, has the authority to do things as he sees fit in his diocese within certain limits. So you have that dynamic between the individual bishop and the conference wanting to do something in terms of national policy. You know, one of the things I think it might be useful to clarify here, especially for people who aren't Catholic, I think there's a certain perception, I, I picked this up from talking to people in the newsroom, perception that somehow bishops answers to archbishops who answer to cardinals who answer, that there's, we speak of the church as a hierarchical, and sort of the impression is that there's this chain of command and that bishops are somehow just in part of this chain, not recognizing, I don't think, the, the sort of supremacy of the bishop in his own diocese. Yeah, in terms of, of theology, bishops are as high as you go in that sense. I mean, the pope is the bishop of Rome, and in that capacity as bishop of Rome is the president of the entire council or college of bishops. But in terms of the theology of ministry, uh, you can talk about the orders going from deacon to priest to bishop, Episcopal consecration is as high as you go. And so in that sense, all bishops are equal viewed sacramentally. Uh, and then what comes from that are kind of uh, legal or juridical um, rights and obligations of bishops to, to run their diocese. You've seen the drafts of these, these two proposals right. that are out there for debate this week. What do you think about these? I think they're, they're really quite good. Um, it's the best I've seen of any of the public statements made by the bishops, the cardinals, and even the pope in the April meeting that the, uh, the pope had with the cardinals and Bishop Wilton Gregory from the U.S. Conference. And the reason why I say it's the best is, I mean, it includes some elements that we've seen in previous public statements, a statement of regret and sorrow for um, the, the harm that has been done to victims and survivors, an actual apology. So some of that's the same. But the new elements are 
really moving forward in terms of establishing a review board in every diocese to deal with uh, you know, allegations of sexual abuse, and that these review boards should have a majority of lay representation, I think is something new. Um, the creation of a national office for child and youth protection being monitored by an additional review board made up of parents and laity, um, and I would presume also some of the previous survivors and victims of, of abuse. So I see those as really um, very important steps to try to reestablish credibility and to make the step that namely this is an issue that affects all the church and therefore uh, the victims and survivors need to be included and those who, have, who are let's say parents or relatives of those victims and survivors being included in the process of review. One of the things that is and part of creating these boards as part of that is the whole idea of transparency, of making this process open in the future so that things aren't kept secret. How much though is there sort of a structural inbuilt sense of closeness, secrecy, internal, we'll keep things inside the house, and therefore moving in this direction, how much troubles are going to be actually, actually implementing these l boards with lay domination that really have influence? Right. Realistically, I think there will be some difficulty, and it's simply the weight of history, at least as I see it. I mean, from at least the fourth or fifth century through the Second Vatican Council, um, the church was largely understood as, a, let's say, a community of people in fidelity to the message of Christ, but as an institution as well, run by the hierarchy. And it's with Vatican II that we see kind of a, a return to a more biblical approach that says the church is made up of the entire people of God and lay people, by virtue of their baptism, have a place in, if you will, even the governance of the church. So we talk about the threefold mission of Christ as priest, prophet, and king, that the laity share in that. Well, we've had a longer history where laity have not been involved, let's say, in the decision-making in the church. Vatican II coming only 40 years ago, um, kind of endorsing this notion of the common priesthood of the laity, um, the weight of history is kind of against that. There's still, I think, this, this long historical tradition of saying, well, things are normally run by the, the hierarchy, and you can consult the laity, but they really shouldn't be involved in, in decision-making. And so the real challenge, I think, is namely whether or not the, the entire Catholic Church can really more fully implement the vision of Vatican II. So this is really a concrete challenge to go back and pick up some of those messages from the mid-60s. I think so. And, and apply them in, in, a, in a new context. Exactly. When you look at this situation, you're talking about the weight of history. Mm -hmm. A lot, and, and even this one, docu the one document calls this um, this begins in the preamble, mm -hmm. our beloved church is experiencing a crisis without precedent in our times. Mm -hmm. Looking at this from a historical point of view, how important is this current crisis? How does it line up, say, compared to the Protestant Reformation? Mm -hmm. There are some parallels with the Protestant Reformation in terms of uh, 14th and 15th century was a time in church history where there were, were lots of allegations and actual facts of misuse of clerical privilege. Um, there were sexual abuse cases that weren't called that uh, back then. But I think what made it different, uh, that situation, so although there are some similarities, uh, the Protestant Reformation from the current situation, is that ultimately the Protestant Reformation led to a division of the Western Church. And I think that was not simply because of clerical abuses uh, and other need for reform in the church, but one of the issues was theological, that people were concerned about the salvation of souls, the, uh, this doctrine of justification and salvation, which separated Martin Luther from the, the Catholic Church. I don't see that same issue here, that namely, um, certainly victims and survivors of abuse have seen perhaps their own faith commitment to Christ through the church severely damaged by this um, crisis. But I think other people who have not been personally touched uh, somehow differentiate their, their faith as, as Catholics from the abuse committed by priests and, and bishops. And so in that sense, I think the kind of the, the ramifications and effects on the church will probably be different in this case, but no less serious. I mean, very, very serious, but what lead to a schism in the church, uh, I don't think so. One of the things that during the Reformation, one of the themes was ordinary Christians, baptized Christians, mm -hmm taking back power, uh, reclaiming the, the, the message of, of, of Jesus mm -hmm. for themselves and 
not worrying about what the clergy was saying, sort of that up from the bottom, has some of these same themes today. You know, we were talking about the importance of the laity today. Um, are there some parallels there, or not, you know, are there some differences in the status of the laity? Yeah, there, there are some parallels. I mean, the issue you raised was one of the three big points that divided uh, Protestant reformers in the 16th century from Catholics. It was the authority of Scripture versus authority of Scripture and tradition um, understood by the Pope. It was uh, this issue of justification that I just mentioned, and the other, the priesthood of all believers, which was resisted by the Catholic Church in the 16th century, but endorsed uh, with qualification at Vatican II. So there is that, that parallel. The significant difference, though, I think, is namely the extent of education of people, that the Reformation was largely led by those few individuals who had education. I mean, uh, Luther was a university professor, Calvin was very well educated, et cetera. But the laity, in, in large numbers, were illiterate, and that was beginning to change because of the university system. Now we live with a, with a very educated Catholic laity, and uh, in the wake of the Enlightenment that encouraged people to think for themselves, they have this, this view of saying, well, I'm not sure I'm going to believe what a leader, whether in the state or in the church, is going to tell me. I can check the sources myself. What does the Bible say? What is the tradition? And they'll look at it more critically, and I think it's because of that level of, of education and perhaps also American culture that kind of encourages people to, uh, to think critically. You know, this whole question of the American culture. The American church has always been something of a mystery to the Vatican, mm -hmm. for example. In the midst of this crisis, the cardinals were called to the Vatican, along with the head of the, the bishops' conference. Mm -hmm. How do you perceive the role of the Vatican behind the scenes at Dallas and after Dallas? What, what's the role there? What's going on between the Vatican and the American church? I think the, the Vatican is going to be very much involved and was involved already in April with regard to whatever proposals get endorsed by the uh, Episcopal Conference here with regard to uh, canon law. Uh, it seems to me, I'm not a canon law expert, but uh, the, the... Tell, explain what canon law is. I think a lot of people, that gets used, but right. people don't necessarily know what it is. Canon law, very simply put, um, is a very extensive code of laws pertaining to matters within the church. So namely, how things are, are handled, and it deals with the laity, it deals with religious, it deals with the clergy, and then the various functions of the church in terms of teaching, sanctifying, and governing. And it's, uh, it's basically church law. As, as compared with, with civil law. The question sometimes has arisen, though, especially in this context of these incidents, sexual abuse incidents, not being reported to civil authorities, mm -hmm. which, by the way, these documents say they will, will be, be from this right. point on. Right. Uh, but in the past, it's, there, it has sometimes been said, or it has sounded like it's been said, oh, we'll handle that within the confines of, of canon law. We don't have to worry about civil law. What traditionally has been see, seen as the relationship of canon law and civil society in, in America, particularly? Uh, it's had a mixed relationship, I mean, historically. I mean, it, the canon law goes back for a very, very long history, and part of it included kind of exemptions or immunity for clergy from civil law, which gradually got changed. And as you get closer to the 20th century, we see that many of those exemptions that clergy used to enjoy, for example, if they were accused of a crime in the Middle Ages and later, they would go to a church court rather than a civil court to be um, heard on, the, on these charges. That changed uh, really as we got into the modern period, 19th and 20th century. And so for the American church, really since um, the early 20th century, uh, those kind of privileges have disappeared. But I think the weight of history still has, has its influence. Habit goes a lot longer than, uh, it, uh, frame of mind it, uh, carries on a lot longer than the, what changes on paper. It used to be a part of canon law that namely it was a law of the church that the laity owed reverence to the clergy and different degrees of reverence depending on their status in the church. And I mean, that was part of law in the church, and now that's no longer part of the, the Code of Canon Law that was revised in 1983. We have less than a minute. Let, let me just ask you, going into this week of meetings in Dallas, and I will go to those meetings, and, and another reporter from here will go as well, um, what's your personal, speaking now on a personal level, what's your personal hope What's your personal expectation? My personal hope is that there will be a tremendous amount of consensus around this charter document, that uh, the bishops will speak with one voice, that they will reiterate um, very sincere contrition and sorrow for the harm that has been done either by priests or bishops or bishops in terms of not handling cases of abuse better, 
and that they will give some sign that um, these uh, norms really will be implemented with teeth. And many dioceses, including our own, has had a decree on protection of children for a number of years, the one here I think since 1993. Right. But some people say they really haven't been put into effect and that's going to be the difference. They're going to have to convince people that this will be implemented. Bill, thank you for being here this morning. You're welcome. Stay tuned. After the break, a look at an effort to capitalize on one resource shared by the entire region, the Ohio River Corridor. Welcome back. For over a year, hundreds of volunteers from Maysville, Kentucky to Madison, Indiana and everywhere in between have been meeting under the banner of the Ohio River Corridor Initiative of the Metropolitan Growth Alliance. The goal has been to first identify the resources of the river and the river valley that they all share and second to explore ways to work cooperatively across the 150 mile stretch of the corridor that you see here. Those meetings are bearing fruit. This month in two public ways. On June the 28th, everyone is invited to gather for a symposium on Great River Cities. I'll have more information about that at the end of the program. But first, earlier this week, a studio of 28 graduate students in the School of Planning at UC released this report, Connecting Communities, Past, Present, and Future of the Ohio River Corridor. To discuss the findings of that report, I am joined by Carla Schifos, an assistant professor of planning who, who co-directed the special graduate studio, and Katie Rausch, a student member of the studio and the editor of the report. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. This idea of planning for a region, we talk about regionalism all the time. Um, and it's something that I believe in, so I do a lot of things on this show about that. But planning for a region that strings out over 150 miles, is this a particular planning challenge from your perspective, Carla? Oh, definitely. When we first took on this assignment, we thought, how are we going to deal with, it's, it's actually 300 miles when you look at both sides of the river and all the places there. River, rivers have two banks. <laughs> that's right. And that's a very large area with many counties, many jurisdictions, many different boundaries cutting through it, and we didn't know how we were going to approach this. And we started out, like you said, just gathering the information to see what's there. And I think the students were very creative in, the, in how they tried to handle it. Um, and I think one of the ways they did this was breaking it down into small chunks, chewable bites that could be thought about. We'll take a look at some of those little bites in a, as we go along here. Uh, Katie, what were some of the, you know, the range of issues, the range of concerns that the students tried to take on and, and at least consider as important elements in this planning process? Well, <coughs> excuse me, um, we began kind of by doing some research on the area so we could gather some of that information on the um, concerns, um, but for the most part we were looking at creating an area that was attractive to people not only within the area but people outside of the area who might come in as tourists or as new residents. Um, and mainly we wanted to make the river a focal point and capitalize on the assets of the river. When we talk about assets, you know, the river is known by some people, people who boat on it, people who have explored, uh, as a historian, people who like exploring the small towns or the museums. But for a lot of people, they've turned their back on the river. They don't deal with the river anymore, whether because of flooding or, or whatever set of issues. When you say re, uh, assets, what, what do you think of when you, what do you mean by assets? Well, um, there's, the river is a great asset as a transportation corridor. Um, barge traffic, it's a, I mean, it's a big business on the Ohio River, um, transporting goods across the United States. Um, and so we tried to capitalize on that in some of the strategies that we looked at. Also, the river as a historical entity um, the river as you know the boundary for the Underground Railroad. Um, Certainly a hot topic in this community. Definitely and especially with the new museum right. going in downtown. Right. Um, just looking what at about the better. natural environment? How, how did you know the the river has been this industrial transportation corridor uh, we've been building along it for over 200 years how would you evaluate, Carla, what, do you, what, what did the, the, the studio sort of discover 
is the state of the natural resource of the, of the river, the environmental condition? Uh, I think we looked at both the river, the water, and then the land area along the river. Of course, we, I think we're all aware that the water itself, there are a lot of problems, and that's going to be a challenge to clean that up and going to take an effort of many people. Along the river, we found there are still a lot of natural areas, but there's actually not a very good inventory. We don't have a good knowledge of what's there. You know, the bird people know where the birds are, and the people interested in wetlands know where they are, but there's not a good comprehensive understanding of what ecological resources we have there, and I think we still have a lot. Now, one of the maps that you developed, and we have that map that we can put up, it's, uh, it's the last one, 7831, um, we can put up, shows sort of the relationship of the industrial areas to the agricultural areas. And uh, let's see, is this, yeah, this is what we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Katie, can you just sort of describe from what people are looking at right now, what's on that map? Um, well, we have um, in the kind of tan colored zones, the agricultural zones within the area, areas where agricultural uses are predominant. Um, and you can see there's kind of one off to the west border and then one off to the east border of the river. Um, and then we have mapped in the kind of rose color, um, the areas where industrial uses are more predominant. Um, we didn't do Cincinnati in and of itself just because there's a lot of uses within there. Right. Um, but you can see those are mostly off to the west. So in this, do you see, you know, you, you, when, when I asked you about assets, you first brought up the, the, the transportation, the, the barge traffic. On that map, you show the industrial history and the industrial reality. In your plan, obviously there's some tension between natural resources, industrial resources, but this is not a plan that's saying, gee, we got, got to get rid of the industrial modern world. Is that, am I right on that? Am I reading this correctly? Mm -hmm. oh, definitely. Or is there a conflict, though? There's a conflict, but we really stress the idea of sustainability and that there are ways to think about these things together. It's going to take a little bit different way of thinking, but those ideas are out there and they can be applied. Yeah, I, I think that's important because I think so often people hear about plans like this and they think, gee, it's all about green space. Uh, wetlands and somehow it's, there's a bias against that true business of the river and there really isn't in this report and there mm -hmm. it certainly isn't in the uh, Ohio River Corridor Initiative. One other area and, and you mentioned it or one of you mentioned it earlier is the, the, the goal to attract tourism mm -hmm. and, and we all know that tourism is a big business. It's not just something we casually do. It's big business. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you did, the students did, was identify different types of areas and activities. Can you talk about that? Because that's really kind of interesting. Uh, well, we identified areas along the river that have um, resources that could be marketed to tourists, um, historic preservation areas, um, uh, old houses that are on the National Historic Register, um, areas like that that could attract tourists. And we developed the map. Um, Which you're seeing right now? Yeah, that, and this map shows the different areas that we've developed. Um, we came up with five nodes of um, activity. Uh, the first one would be like the Camper's Paradise node where people could go and camp and place, but there's also... Um, I, the I, I love the water sports down near Madison. Is that playing <laughs> off of the, of the race that's there every year? Definitely, yeah. It's necessary for these communities to capitalize on what they already have. And what's the one up there by Lawrenceburg, the golden <laughs> something node? The golden greens node. Yeah, what's that? That's about the casinos and golf courses ah, that are geez. there. Casinos <laughs> and golf courses. We're going to put those guys together. Where do we go from here? Well, we have we, less than a minute. Here. We have to get people together talking. And that's already started through this initiative that was started by Metropolitan Growth Alliance and all the people that are already involved. And I think more people need to realize that it's going to take people getting together and talking and planning together. It doesn't mean that we all have to have one big plan that we all stick to, but we need to coordinate our plans. And we have a vision. And, you know, having worked on this for the last year with Metropolitan Growth Alliance as one of the committee members, it's really great to see the students come along and put this all together into a vision. So really appreciate what you've done, appreciate you being here this morning. If you would like to sign up for the River City Symposium, you can log on to the website of the Metropolitan Growth Alliance at mgacincinnati.org or call the Alliance's offices at 513-241-2880. The symposium will open on 
uh, June the 28th with lunch that features an address by the Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Australia. In the afternoon, participants can choose among 16 different workshops and panel discussions and continue this discussion. And the next morning, you can join a giant kayak and canoe trip downriver that ends at Cincinnati. Thank you for making newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. 12 re news reporter Frank Graff, videographer Alan Guile, and I will be reporting this week from the Catholic Bishops Conference in Dallas. Next week's newsmakers will originate from Dallas, where Archbishop Pelargic has promised to give his first one-on-one -on -one television interview on this program. We close this morning with some scenes from the Ohio River. Have a good week. I never lost one minute of sleep, and I was worried about the way the things.